working on a kind of geophysical phenomena, and uh, we'll talk about uh, this issue uh, from the viewpoint of statistical physics. And uh, the, most of the work is done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Spadi Ploy, who just moved to uh, BITS Kiraji uh, in Hyderabad. So uh, in geophysical situation, uh, there are many natural disasters uh, ranging from uh, landslides and uh, volcanic eruptions and also earthquakes. And these three are just uh, natural disasters, but sometimes this kind of large building collapse spontaneously. Uh, and uh, this can also cause a very serious disaster. And both of them uh, involve a kind of slow and uh, time-dependent deformation process that leads to failure. And that is uh, the main concern uh, here. So uh, what is very difficult about earthquakes or uh, the material failure is that we cannot see inside. So the we can obtain a very limited information about what is going on in the system. Uh, in contrast, uh, in both Japan and India suffer from typhoon or cyclones. Uh, in this case, uh, we can actually see what is going on uh, by the information obtained from uh, satellites. So in such cases, uh, time evolution is uh, known because we know the underlying physics, uh, which may be Navier-Stokes equation. So uh, we know uh, much about this kind of system. But for this kind of solid Earth or more complex materials, um, the basic physics is basically not known, and they mostly involve uh, biological problems, and also uh, that can be also uh, combined with the problem of phase transitions, and it makes the uh, problem very uh, complicated. So, uh, of course, we know the um, continuum mechanics for this kind of solids, but the uh, main problem is that we don't know the constitutive laws uh, that governs uh, deformation of solid earth. And uh, due to this uh, uh, information loss, uh, sometimes earthquakes are very uh, abrupt. Uh, as well as the volcanic eruptions and landslides. They are mostly uh, occur suddenly. So uh, the natural question would be, uh, are this kind of uh, natural disaster intrinsically abrupt? Or it is just because we cannot observe uh, their signs due to the uh, difficulty in observations. So uh, this is a kind of hypothetical questions, but we can ask uh, in such a way, uh, are they, uh, or would they be predictable if we could obtain all the necessary information? Uh, in different words, uh, we can also say like this, uh, are they predictable in laboratory where we can obtain all the necessary information. So, uh, of course, the observation is a very important problem, but here we don't consider this and uh, separate the problems uh, between the physical mechanism and also the difficulty in observations. So we focus here uh, the uh, mechanism, essential mechanisms that lead to uh, sudden catastrophic events. 
So uh, in case uh, you are not familiar with uh, solid uh, failure, uh, this is just a brief review of the uh, theory proposed by Greg Fitz, which is more than 100 years ago. So this theory consists of uh, two ingredients in uh, mechanical energy in, uh, stored in the solid objects. The one component is the elastic energy decreases uh, due to the uh, increase in the length of the uh, cracks. So suppose this object contains the size R uh, pre-existing uh, crack, and uh, with this size R, uh, uh, the total elastic energy stored in this uh, object uh, decreases uh, like this. Here is the Young's modulus, and sigma is the applied stress. And the other component is the interface energy and the crack. Uh, and this is proportional to the size of the crack. And the proportionality coefficient is gamma, which is the surface energy of the solid. By considering these two components, the total mechanical energy of solids uh, as a function of R, uh, looks like this. So first it is an increasing function, so we need work to extend this uh, graph. But uh, at, if the size, size exceeds some uh, threshold, which is denoted by RC, then the total energy starts to decrease as R increases. And that means uh, we don't no, uh, need force to extend this uh, crack. And that means uh, the material uh, instantaneously uh, fails. And uh, this Griffith criterion can give us the hint to estimate the uh, distance uh, to the failure. Uh, we can have uh, this RC as a function of the applied stress and also the surface energy. So, uh, and also we know sigma, and from this we can infer this RC. And also we can consider like this. So, uh, suppose we know the maximum crack size uh, that is contained in a specific uh, sample, and that is R max. And if uh, we know R max, then from this <laughs> equation, we know the uh, threshold stress, sigma. Uh, and uh, if the applied stress is larger than this value, then the sample will b b break. And this is given by this kind of equation. So uh, in this uh, simple theory, one can basically uh, know the critical stress for the uh, failure stress of a uh, yeah, object. Uh, but it is uh, basically uh, very difficult to know the size of the pre-existing cracks and that would be a difficulty observations. And uh, uh, to know the such a size is very difficult and uh, also the more difficult uh, point in reality is that uh, solid material is very heterogeneous in usual. It is, of course, in the case of uh, landslides or any uh, geophysical situation. Uh, but also uh, man-made 
structure uh, has a lot of heterogeneous structure uh, that uh, make uh, uh, material more strong. So uh, in this case, uh, this uh, surface energy gamma or this Young's modulus E can be also heterogeneous, uh, which makes the uh, problem more complicated. So uh, in such cases, uh, simple Griffith theory doesn't apply. And also, uh, in addition to the heterogeneity, uh, this kind of inelastic process is also uh, very important. And uh, for complex materials, uh, damage accumulation process occurs uh, if we deform such objects. And that can be understood as the increase of the density of micro fracture that uh, degrades the material. And as the number of uh, micro fracture increases, the system eventually fails. And in this case, stress strain variation becomes much more complex than the, this kind of ideal uh, brittle materials. And uh, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is that uh, this stress strain variation becomes time dependent due to the uh, micro fracture or micro damage in the solid materials. So uh, this is a, a, a schematic picture uh, of uh, 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 the deformation process, I mean the time dependent pro process. So the point here is that uh, stress is uh, time independent. So the, here the uh, applied stress is constant. But uh, the deformation of the materials uh, occurs at uh, this constant stress. And this is how the strain looks like as a function of time. And uh, after the application of constant stress, uh, the system deforms. And, uh, Straight rate is large at the primary stage. And then this is followed by the secondary stage or secondary creep uh, in which the strain rate is almost constant. And then uh, after sufficiently long time, uh, this strain rate again accelerates. Uh, and this uh, acceleration leads to the failure of the system. And this acceleration behavior is called the tertiary, tertiary creep. And uh, what is important here is the first stage, uh, the primary creep, which is described by the power law uh, as a function of time with some exponent alpha. And uh, uh, the third stage, I mean, the tertiary creep, is also described by the power law with exponent alpha prime. And this alpha and alpha prime are basically a different thing. And here, TF is the failure time of a specimen. So uh, following this e e e equation, the strain rate uh, goes up to infinity uh, towards the uh, rupture. So if we know this tertiary creep. I have one question. So the secondary creep, why are you saying it's constant? Uh, I mean, this is a confusion because typically when we have uh, steady flow, uh, at that time we also say that uh, 
the channel dot is constant. Right? So yes. uh, uh. therefore are you expect that it's not constant but has some back dependence in the second uh, I'm not sure. So this is a very, uh, how can I say, schematic scenario leading to failure. So uh, with very uh, fine uh, observations, we can actually see a subtle time dependence in the secondary grip. But uh, here we don't consider this. Thank you. So uh, if we are interested in the failure time, uh, which may be the time of uh, the catastrophic failure, uh, then this can be used for uh, forecasting the failure. And uh, also, this kind of power law acceleration is common to earthquakes, not only in material science, uh, but uh, is a much larger scale. And this states uh, the aftershocks occurrence rate decreases as a function of time. And here the time is uh, uh, after uh, the main shock, measured after the main shock. And here C is the time constant, which may depend on main shock. And also this exponent P appears, uh, just like uh, uh, in this case. And uh, if we have uh, our, if we focus uh, long time behavior in which uh, the time is sufficiently larger than this time constant, then uh, this n dot uh, is just uh, power law with uh, this exponent p. And that is comparable to the primary type uh, with this. But uh, these exponents are basically different things because here alpha depends on the deformation rate or strain rate but here p, p or uh, sorry uh, the exponent p involves n dot and here n of the, n is the number or the rate of the acoustic events or size, size, uh, seismic events which are aftershocks so uh, basically, P, this P and the alpha could be different. And uh, on top of uh, this exponent and the similarity to primary creep, here uh, this time constant C is also important in the context of earthquakes because uh, it is uh, 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 insisted that uh, this C is a decreasing function of uh, uh, shear stress acting on the uh, uh, fault zone. So suppose uh, we have an intermediate size of uh, earthquakes and aftershocks follow. Then we measure aftershocks rate and fit the data with this law. Then we can infer C. And if, uh, uh, if C is large, then the entire stress uh, acting on that area is still low. So we are uh, uh, not in uh, um, danger uh, in having more earthquakes. But if we observe a smaller C, then uh, the shear stress on that area is still large, so uh, there could be more risk to have uh, further uh, earthquakes. But uh, shear stress acting on uh, earthquake fault is, of course, uh, not directly measurable because it is uh, very, very deep, like uh, 10 kilometers or uh, to 20 or 30 kilometers. So uh, this uh, is uh, still at uh, speculation. 
but uh, in laboratory experiments or uh, computer simulation using a simple model for rocks, uh, uh, some people have confirmed that this C is actually a decreasing function of shear stress. So this is also uh, one of the focus uh, here. And uh, uh, probably the m most useful thing that could forecast large earthquake could be this inverse Omori law that corresponds to two theory creep. But unfortunately, uh, this kind of Omori law uh, that leads to major earthquake uh, has not been observed in natural earthquakes, whereas it is uh, always observed in laboratory experiments. So it's a kind of uh, very big issue in seismology. But what is interesting is that uh, uh, in landslides, uh, this kind of uh, acceleration behavior is commonly observed uh, before we observe uh, large-scale landslides. So uh, after uh, heavy rain, we can deploy a geodetic measurement uh, in the sites uh, that, uh, that are at the uh, risk of landslides, so people can observed the real-time deformation before landslides. And in most uh, cases, we can observe, oh, sorry, we can observe this kind of behavior. And here, V is just the speed of the uh, de deformation of the surface. And in this case, uh, P prime is mostly uh, more or less one, and, but sometimes large. And the uh, last example from a uh, geological scale is uh, volcanic earthquakes, uh, just before the uh, eruption. And before eruption of uh, earth, uh, volcanoes, uh, there are uh, many earthquakes observed in the uh, body of uh, the volcanoes. And this is because uh, uh, volume inflation of volcanoes due to the rising magma. And uh, this is one example taken from this paper. And this is the rate of uh, volcanic earthquakes as a function of a day. So this is a November, and this is uh, starting from November 1st. And the volcanic the eruption was uh, on 15th, and uh, the rate of volcanic earthquakes increases towards uh, this uh, 15th. So, uh, so far we have reviewed the common phenomenology between earthquakes and uh, landslides and also volcanic eruptions. And uh, these share the common properties like this. So uh, here we would like to put forth these questions. Uh, so uh, what determines this exponent alpha prime and also p prime, uh, which usually ranges from uh, uh, 0.6 to uh, 1.5 or something? And uh, if we can uh, know this exponent beforehand, then it can be used as uh, forecasting the time of failure. And also, uh, the, in the context of uh, Omori law, this time constant is important as uh, it may the indicator of the shear stress on fault zone. So to know uh, this kind of uh, problem, uh, together with physical mechanisms, we need a model study. So the model we use here is uh, extremely simple, uh, which may be sometimes called a fiber bundle model. So uh, here we uh, discretize 
the solid into n finite <laughs> elements. And if a force is applied to this specimen, then this uh, n discrete elements will support the load equally. So the, this Fi uh, denotes the force acting on element, or I, then the summation uh, taken for these entire elements should equal to a large F. And to model the randomness contained in actual materials, uh, uh, we introduce uh, own fracture strengths for each element. And uh, this is uh, denoted by HK uh, for <laughs> element K. And this HK is uh, uh, chosen randomly from uh, uh, certain uh, distribution. And this uh, threshold probability distribution uh, could be arbitrary. Uh, that could be a Weibull distribution or any other extreme value statistics. And uh, also we can consider the randomness in <laughs> elasticity, but it is eventually uh, incorporated in the randomness of the fracture strengths. And uh, to consider the dynamics, we need to consider the uh, force relaxation process or stress relaxation process. Uh, during the stress redistribution process, uh, this relation should be uh, observed. So uh, if uh, some fibers or some <laughs> elements uh, are destroyed, then uh, uh, this end decreases, which means that uh, force per element, I mean, force per surviving element should increase. So uh, with this uh, mechanism, uh, if uh, some fiber is broken, then uh, more fiber will be broken. And that is a kind of chain reaction uh, that leading to the failure of the entire system. And uh, we, uh, so generally such a force distribution or stress redistribution uh, has a very complicated manner following the theory of elasticity. But here uh, we focus on a very simple model, which is a mean field, where uh, this force per element is the same for all the surviving fibers. And also we can consider time evolution like this. So the first step is uh, force per element is given. And yeah, okay. Mm, no, mm. they cannot. Uh, thank you. So some elements break uh, if uh, uh, the threshold is exceeded uh, with this FT. And then after, uh, after some elements uh, are destroyed, then force per fiber is recalculated. And this defines the uh, force per fiber at the next moment. And uh, with uh, this kind of uh, loop, I mean, a time evolution loop, one can write down the very simple e e equation, which is the fraction of surviving fibers at time i plus i is given by the force uh, per fiber uh, at uh, time i. And this P of h is a threshold distribution. And using this relation between the force per fiber and uh, uh, 
surviving elements, and then we can write the time evolution equation for F, which is a force per element. And uh, in actual physical process, this kind of rupture of fibers and uh, stress redistribution takes some time. And uh, this time scale can be regarded as an uh, intrinsic time scale in, in this model. So uh, by introducing this time scale T, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, considered as a time derivative of the force per elements. So we can have ODE for the force per fiber. And this uh, F dot is also proportional to the strain rate, uh, since the strain is proportional to the force per fiber. So we can also think that this is the time evolution equation for the force per fiber, or the strain rate. And uh, because the model is so simple, one can get the analytical solution uh, for a specific uniform distribution case. Uh, here, uh, the maximum value for the threshold is denoted by F max, and the uh, width of the distribution is delta. So the actual distribution function is written like this. And uh, with this, one can rewrite the time evolution equation using this P of H and can end up with this non-dimensionalized time evolution equation. Here X is the non-dimensional force per fiber and this zeta is the non-dimensional load uh, which depends on F naught. And here the important parameter is zeta mm, here. And if zeta is small or is negative, there exist two fixed points for this time evolution. And the smaller one is a stable fixed point, and the larger one is unstable one. And for zeta vanishes, uh, the uh, subtle node bifurcation occurs because uh, this term uh, will vanish. So the stable fixed point and the unstable fixed point merge. And uh, for positive zeta, uh, there are no fixed point, which means that uh, this x uh, uh, monotonically increase with time, uh, which means that the system will eventually fails. And uh, for zeta, uh, uh, is larger than zero. Uh, when, when the system undergoes uh, failure, one can solve uh, this time evolution e e e equation to obtain this kind of form. So this T is the uh, time, and uh, here X is the uh, uh, non-dimensional force. And uh, this <laughs> expression is further simplified if uh, the force is uh, not very large. Then uh, we can write this solution uh, uh, like uh, x equals to uh, this e e e equation. And uh, this uh, e e equation leads to also the uh, uh, power law for the first stage of the deformation and also the accelerating behavior at the later stage with uh, exponent minus two. And also we obtain the analytical expression for the time constant C. So uh, with this, we can reproduce the power law behavior for uh, these two stages of the moment. So, and uh, uh, here we did it for the uniform distribution, but we can show that this scenario is valid for more general 
stress rate distribution like this. For this, uh, we can, uh, it is easier to go back to the, this recursive relation. And uh, here, phi is defined using the threshold distribution. And uh, since this is uh, a map uh, from Fi to Fi plus one, one can uh, consider the time evolution in the space of Fi and Fi plus one. And uh, one can write uh, the function phi in a solid line, and also uh, Fi equals Fi plus one uh, is a dashed line. So the intersection defines the fixed points. So since this phi is a function of F naught, which is a initial force, if F naught is small, then the entire shape of phi is uh, at the lower place. So we have uh, uh, two uh, fixed points. And one can easily see that uh, this is the stable fixed point and uh, this is the unstable fixed point. And for larger normal, sorry, for larger initial stress, this phi of f goes up and uh, eventually uh, these two fixed points merge together. Um, forming uh, one single uh, unstable fixed point, which is a subtle node bifurcation. And uh, even if the, this F node is uh, slightly larger than this F node, uh, we can <laughs> expand this phi of F around uh, this Fc. And uh, with this, expansion, one can obtain the time evolution equation, F naught, and uh, we retain the power law behavior with the exponent two. And this uh, power law behavior with the exponent two is a general property uh, resulting from uh, the uh, saddle dot bifurcation. So this is just a numerical demonstration. Uh, uh, here we confirm uh, uh, the Weibull distribution and we also uh, uh, confirm the power of behavior with exponent two. Uh, and of course, this is a very simple model, so it is not surprising that we cannot reproduce the exponent uh, which is comparable to uh, natural observations, uh, which ranges from 0 0.6 to one, uh, while it is two in the model. And also what is uh, uh, not happy is that uh, this time constant C uh, is an increasing function of the uh, applied stress, which is uh, opposite tendency uh, as proposed in the numerical simulation or um, earthquakes observations. So uh, to consider uh, some more possibility, we extend the model um, in which uh, each fiber can break <laughs> stochastically. Okay. And uh, this is described by uh, this kind of uh, some uh, activation process like failure rule. And we can write down the time evolution equation for the uh, distribution of the surviving fibers. And we uh, retain the power of behavior with exponent uh, comparable to uh, observations. But unfortunately, this exponent matches the value for natural observations, but it depends on the detail of the model. And here, also uh, by incorporating this stochastic row, uh, one can see that this C is actually a uh, uh, decreasing function of the shear stress. Uh, uh, sorry, we, we, we don't have time, so we <laughs> skip the last part. And this is a conclusion. So uh, due to the simplicity of the model, we obtained uh, 
analytical solution for the time evolution of the deformation rate, and then uh, find a robust e exponent uh, two, which is a result from a saddle node bifurcation. Uh, here. And also uh, that time constant C uh, can be either increasing function of a stressing, uh, decreasing function of the stress. And this, so this C would be uh, based on more subtle physical mechanisms. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Questions and uh, yeah, just Pinaki. Yeah, Takairo, you uh, skipped over the self healing part. Can you just mm. go over that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, uh, yeah, uh, healing process is very important in snow failure or ice or granular matter. So, uh, on top of the uh, stochastic fra fra fracture rule, we also incorporate the healing process. Uh, with a stochastic row. And the healing probability is just uh, uh, proportional to the number of broken e elements. And this means that we assume that the healing is a two-body process. Broken ones and two broken ones meet, meet up. And with this, with this, we can write down the time evolution equation. And ah, uh, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, there is a time scale. Yeah, there should be a time scale for healing, but here we consider it is the same for the stress redistribution. Obviously, it should be much longer, maybe. Uh, so, but here uh, we. Uh, assume the same uh, uh, time constant. Uh, and uh, what is interesting that uh, we observe the acceleration behavior with the uh, exponent minus one. And what is in interesting is that uh, the relaxation process after we apply a constant stress. And this is a strain rate as a function of time. And depending on the healing rate, uh, if the healing is uh, large enough, then uh, it, it, it eventually goes to steady state. But the uh, healing is uh, uh, not sufficient, then it, uh, the system will fail. Uh, that corresponds to the increase in this branch. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, these behaviors can obey the scaling law, just as we observe for a uh, particulate system near jamming behavior. And also this exponent t to the half is also common to particulate systems. Ah, Santa, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yes. So you mentioned about the, how the event rate in earthquake it uh, decreases with time so uh, the size of the event uh, does it have a dependence uh, that's a very good question because it has been also a matter of discussion in seismology and some people believe that the uh, average size of earthquakes uh, is uh, not time dependent even in the aftershock regime, but some people insist that uh, 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 we tend to have larger aftershocks right after the main shock, and uh, average size will decrease as time goes on after the main shock. So uh, we don't have a particular answer for that question for the moment. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. One more question? You have a question? Yeah? Mm -hmm. no. Okay, so you rest. Yeah, if there is uh, no further question, then let's thank Takairo for this nice and interesting talk. Thank you very much. And